ICQ Podcast Episode 287, 50 Years of Worked All Britain. Hi there fellow Amateur Radio Enthusiasts and welcome to this, our 287th episode of the ICQ Amateur Radio Podcast, supported by Robert Giselle, uh, Kilo Echo 5, Victor Yankee India, along with our monthly and subscription donors. In this episode, Martin in my MLB is joined by Chris, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Dan, Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, and Frank, Foxtrot 4, Foxtrot Mike Hotel, to discuss the latest Amitam Radio News. Myself, Colin, M6BRY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is a feature on the 50th anniversary of the Work Tool Britain Award. Well, as always, it's your donors that keep us advert free, and uh, this episode, uh, Robert, uh, Kilo Echo 5, Victor uh, Lima India is our uh, one-off donor, along with uh, increasing his monthly subscription as well. So thank you, Robert, for your uh, your support of the show. It really is greatly appreciated that you're finding the value in the show and, uh, say, supporting us and keeping us advert-free. This uh, model of, uh, say, accepting uh, donors rather than advertising obviously keeps the, the show purer for you. And uh, we hope you find value in this episode and consider us by visiting www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. Or as we say, anything you send away helps pay our running costs and keep us advert free. It's the uh, last few days to uh, get your uh, name on the ICQ podcast uh, presenter's shirts that were uh, getting printed up. And there's the last couple of slots available. So they'll be disappearing uh, in the week. Uh, so say if you want to help out with that, I say go to that donation page and you'll find the link there to get involved. Well, now we join uh, Martin, Chris, Martin, Dan and Frank to discuss latest Amazon radio news, including Oscar 100 receiver online and the uh, ham radio retail business. Hope you enjoy. Well, hi guys, and welcome to episode 287, uh, News Roundtable for the ICQ podcast. And uh, tonight, I'm joined by Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Hi Martin, and hi to the guys waiting in the wings. Yeah, hi mate. And hi hi to Mr. Martin Roffo, M0SGL, who's probably going to get me into trouble again. Well, I, I, I'm going to try, but you know what it's like. Chris is here. He keeps he keeps us in check. It's not going to happen. He does. He does, I'm afraid. But it's okay, but, yeah. because we've got our American friends to lead us astray as well. We have. We and have. Then, it, then, that, then that's like four against one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we also have Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU. Hi, Dan. Hi there. I will certainly try. Yeah, and you're almost snowed in, aren't you? You've been out shoveling the drive and... Uh, oh, man, it's terrible here. Yeah, yeah. Well, Is that what you're telling the boss? That's why you're not coming into work today. <laughs> well, I work at home, so I can't. Oh. And I work for myself, so that's a problem. <laughs> oh, so you can't throw a sickie easy, Dan, can you? <laughs> no, no. No, no, no. And last but not, ne- last but not least, uh, we have Mr. Frank Howell, K4FMH. Hi, Frank. Hey, guys. Uh, I just woke up from my nap. It's 62 degrees and sunny here in Mississippi. Yeah, <laughs> you're, nice. you're just trying to wind Dan up now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well, it's uh, great to have all four of you with us tonight. Ed's, um, Ed Durant is uh, with the other group at the moment um, because uh, Matthew's uh, doing things. So uh, just the five of us tonight, and uh, away we go. Our first news story Get your ham license in a in a day, and I thought we might have to send the boys round for this one because they're moving it on Dan's territory. But then <laughs> I was told they're on the west coast and Dan's sort of in the middle of the country. There's about two thousand miles between them. So, what do you think, Dan? Yeah, they're 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 no uh, competition to me. In fact, I, I do I do whatever I can to uh, support these people that are setting up these classes. I, uh, you know, I. Let, let them use my technician class study guide for free and uh if they want print versions i give them discounts of it so i'm uh, i'm all for more people offering these one day tech classes yeah i think the important thing is and uh, we've grown up about it the more people we get in the hobby the better it is for all of us uh, really isn't it uh frank what's your thoughts <laughs> Well, I, I think it uh, it's good. Uh, you know, I hear them sometimes called the easy bake ham license. That is, you know, <laughs> pop it in the oven, it comes out in a day. But th- the truth of the matter is, is that getting technicians licensed 
is generally a good thing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. I, I think uh, Dan and some others have, have kind of led the way on that. And I don't really see a downside to it. No, no. I, in fairness, I mean, it's, it's like a foundation license in the UK. It's you're dipping your toe in the water. It's getting started. And once you've got started, you know, you, you're able to go on the air and take part and uh, hopefully they'll move on. I mean, Chris and I have done 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 the, the uh, technician. We didn't do it in a day, though, did we, Chris? We didn't, but um, we probably could have. We read the book beforehand, maybe. Yeah. Talking of foundation, we are doing a foundation course um, next month, but that's a two-day course that we do. I'm guessing for this one-day course, the person has to have probably read the book beforehand, maybe before they uh, turn up and do you know turn up, just kind of get some more additional help. But um, but uh, the good thing also about this one is that they've managed to get some. Um, some mainstream uh, publicity. So they've actually got themselves on the KTVZ or VZ news channel. So they've actually got an article there, which is good. So it sounds like they've got some, you know, spreading the word about a hobby. So that's, um, I like that. Certainly is. And Martin, we haven't managed to get you to do the technician or the American exam yet, have we? No, well, I'm, I'm still of the opinion, like, I've got a full license in the UK, which I can use on a reciprocal agreement. I, you know, I probably got the UK license on a fluke. If I go to America and get the uh, um, a license out there, then um, I'm limited by those privileges, and I might not get the full license out there because obviously there are a lot. The, you know, the questions are are a lot harder because of the amount of power and stuff you're allowed to use. I mean, 1500 watts still, still to me seems amazing power for a technician to have. Let alone, you know, even if you're a, a full license in the UK, we don't even get that. But um, no, this this story can only be good. Not sure how hard it is to get your license in America. So, you know, anything that gets more people on the air is good. Although I do know if you go to kb6nu.com, you can get some great study guides uh, also available on Amazon uh, if you uh, want to compliment this. Good good uh, thinking there. Yeah. yeah, nice yeah tip. We, I'm sure Dan will support me on that tip. Yeah. We, we, don't, <laughs> we don't do advertising on here, but we do look after our presenters. And, uh, well, Dan yeah, I mean, those. that's not that's at least an unpaid ad. I know. <laughs> I, 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 Recommending I, I, a product, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> and I've recommended Dan's study guides many times. They're so well worth a good look at them. And uh, as I and they're free. The technician class license uh, study guide is free. Yeah. Well, what more? What more could they want, Dan? Uh, That's apart right. From, apart from you taking the test for them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's let's stop before we get into lots I'm of biting trouble. my tongue before I say anything else at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's stop before we get into all sorts of trouble. Chris is shaking his head, so so uh, <laughs> not particularly. Uh, right. Uh, moving on, uh, the Qatar Oscar One Hundred uh, mm. satellite that's up there. This is geostationary satellite um, is uh, in operation at the moment, and. You can actually go to the website, and there is an SDR receiver, and uh, we're seeing people going through it at the moment, aren't we, Chris? Yeah, I was. I think you and I have both looked at something, Martin, today. So the S Hale Two, which you talked about before on the podcast, um, is up there. It's working, and uh, BATC and AMSAT UK have put up a, a web SDR, which I think is operating through Goon Hilly. Oh, no, sorry, they're providing the uh, hosting for the ground, st- ground station facility in Cornwall. So, yeah, there's a couple of things you can you can tune in. There's a wideband spectrum viewer, so you can look at the whole spectrum of, of traffic going through. And there's also an, uh, a web SDR, so you can go and listen to specific parts of the spectrum. So, yeah, it's actually really interesting. You can hear people talking live. And, of course, with it being um, geostationary, it's all very easy. You know, the, you know, you don't have to track the, you know, so he's, he's up there all the time. You don't have to track it across the sky for five minutes. There's no worrying about uh, Doppler shift. It's just, well, WebSDR, if you go, you can listen in. Uh, which makes me, this, this actually might encourage people. You know, it is on 10 gigahertz, so you will require some uh, specialist kit, maybe a transversal or something. But yes, um, it's might encourage folks to get a bit, get involved with it. So um, yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. I'd, I'd play with it. It looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's pretty good. Mine, uh, you and I are paying satellites a bit more this year, I believe, so... Um... But this is worth yeah. a look, isn't it? Yeah, well, so I've got my satellite antenna, my uh, Arrow antenna on the shelf over there that I've still I've put it together. I haven't actually tried it yet other than pointing at a local repeater and see if I can see if it made a difference. I haven't had to listen to this yet, but I'm quite excited about it. I'm quite excited the fact that there is a, uh, a geostationary bird up there. 
And so we mentioned before, you know, it's it's on 10 gigs. You can't just use your 2 meter 77 hand down to uh, make it work, you know, and you've got to go and buy specialist kit, which again is not necessarily available from your favorite ham store. But uh, hey, if people can go online, have a listen, hear the kind of traffic that's going through these things, it may encourage people to get on the air with it. It may encourage people to try some of the other birds. So um, yeah, win win all round, I think. Well, I think it's good that people can just go and have a look at the SDR and uh, the web SDR on it and, and gauge whether it's worth doing. Because um, there's no point. Try in before going you out buy. Spend, yeah, but try before you buy. I think it's yeah. a good one. Now, unfortunately, uh, the guys in the States, you're not in the footprint, but you can still use the SDR. What do you think, Frank? Oh, I'm, I love the web-based SDR uh, technology, and, and I think this just extends it to the, the birds and the satellite stuff. At a club meeting last night, uh, had a little demonstration of a hand-built. It, it's not exactly the arrow uh, antenna, but but uh, kind of a, a simple thing you can build, put into a PVC pipe, and, and go out and try to work some of the satellites. So there's a tremendous growth and interest in doing this, and I think this just helped. I think you're right. I think you're right, Dan. Uh, the, you know, this is the sort of thing that's going to excite the youngsters, I think, the new people coming into the hobby. Dan, I haven't seen any Morse going for it yet, though. When are you going up there? <laughs> so I have a couple of questions, though, and I should know this because we talked about it on this podcast, but are the uplink and downlink both 10 gigahertz? I'm not 100% sure. So I had sure. a feeling one was around the, either the uplink or the downlink was on 2.5. Three gigahertz, something like. I had a feeling it was somewhere around there. Okay. The and and, and have there have there been any articles yet on how to build the build the equipment needed to to work the satellite? I would like. Is, I haven't checked, and, and I should it. do. This is an AMSAT uh, Germany or an AMSAT DL project. Uh, yeah. The AMSAT DL website has got to English uh, text on it, and I'm sure the microwave boys. We'll be talking um, on various microwave reflectors about this. So there's there's more and more information going up all the time about this, um, but I think I think I think it's worth a look. Yeah. Well, so so we you know we have another item coming up here about um, the use of the microwave bands, and and this is just another impetus to get people on microwaves. So this is uh, this will be good. Yeah, I think so. Um, all right, yeah, just double checked. On, so there is a there is an operating guide and uh, and band plan on the msatdl.org website. And Martin's right; it's two point four gigahertz uplink yeah, and ten gigahertz uh, downlink. Yeah, I remember it being two point four because I think at the time when we covered the news story, um, I think I made the comment about two point four gigs. You sure about that? With all the uh, Wi-Fi traffic that's there. Mm. Yeah, but it's not so much of a problem if it's an uplink. Cause we'll no, if be... you're pointing it in the sky, I guess. But, yeah, uh, but, but yeah. if it's and, and do they have a web page about suggested equipment? Haven't seen that yet, Dan. Haven't seen that yet. Although okay. um, one of the uh, one of the guys was threatening to, uh, from one of the other clubs. He's also a member of our club. Was threatening to do a talk on uh, doing mm. a, um, a a simple receiver for this. Uh, by, was, converting, yeah. uh, by converting a satellite, um, a TV satellite dish and uh, LMB uh, to start receiving this stuff. So it could, it, I think it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on this one. I yeah, think Emma would be cool. a bit cross if I took our satellite dish down and uh, so <laughs> she put the telly on and suddenly all she could hear was amateurs going, <laughs> five, nine, next. <laughs> 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 what happened to 4OD? <laughs> You haven't been married that long. Dude, I would I would suggest not doing that. Yeah, I don't I don't think wise, you know, I'm not that brave. <laughs> yeah, Colin has a Colin has a saying, you beg for forgiveness afterwards, you don't ask in advance. Yeah, I have to yeah. Donate more than the length of coax, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be a little more than a length of coax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. We're also going to get into trouble on that one, aren't we? But yeah, fine. It's it's a very interesting. Well, there will be a number of links in the uh, show notes for this. The British Amateur Radio Television Club are uh, involved with it. AMSAT UK, AMSAT Germany. Is it, it's there's a lot of information starting to appear out there, so well worth a look. Kind of moving on, supporting innovation through wireless technology, Ofcom 
are, are talking about uh, industry using um, spectrum from one gig to uh, 75 gigs for innovation. And as as the uh, HF bands get noisier and noisier with everything, uh, all the interference down there, I wonder how long it's going to be before us amateurs effectively end up at, all up in the microwave bands and potentially using satellites like this anyway. Um, Dan, what's your thoughts? Well, so this I guess back to my uh, comment about the uh, the uh, SL satellite operation. You know, we we need somebody to come up with some equipment that people can buy and or easily build to use it because if it's too hard to to get on, people are just aren't going to get on. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think if they if this looks as popular as I think it's going to be, I'm I'm sure we're going to see transfer to kits very very soon for this. Yeah, so that I mean that's what's going to be needed for hands to get on the the microwaves. You know, already already the guys who are you know the real wizards you know of microwave are on microwave, but for the rest of us, you know, we need a little bit more hand holding. Yeah, yeah. Well, and say so, yeah, those frequencies, you know, it's a true, blob man. of solder can knock knock your frequency, can't it? So what do you think, right. Chris? Um, so back to the yeah back to this talk about the Ofcom and the use of supporting innovations with wireless technology well uh, there's an awful lot of innovation now relying on wireless technology already so you think about you know everything in your house you've got your the wife a lot of things connecting by wi-fi you've got your mobile phone that's connecting via 3g 5g 4g 5g um coming up um you know i've got i don't know how much stuff in my house that's been using wireless technology i've got a you know wireless thermostat i've got a thing that controls central heating boiler all wireless um is a phenomenal amount of, so i think wireless technology is is exploding so this is just talking about one you know talking about how they can help businesses to become more efficient using using wireless technology now whether this is just an advert for them so they can then make money out of the license i don't, I don't know but uh, <laughs> it's just it's just interesting that this is this is what um uh ofcom are um are, you know seriously, seriously promoting as a as a as a way of uh being you know being innovative and uh and moving forward and being more efficient yeah yeah well i know what you mean about all the uh, technology we do because uh, i was playing with um, uh, wireless switches yesterday evening um, while we were doing something else so uh, yeah i know what you mean martin have you uh, you're not a microwave person oh you do go up on 23 sems so um, i do 23 sems um but only on the sort of the uk AC, I'm not going to call it a contest, it's the thing they do on Tuesday nights, just for an activity night really, and it's more because it's it's a different mode to play with, and I quite enjoy it, um, and 10 watts and 23 sems work surprisingly well, even cross polarisation. Micro is definitely harder to use, shorter range, you know, Dan mentioned kits, kits are harder to come by, you can't just go to your ham shop and buy it, um, you've got to build them. Um, but I, you know, so from the point of view of, will we ever end up moving away from HF up there? I don't know. I'm fighting it, but uh, it's probably going to happen at some point. It doesn't surprise me that Ofcom are trying to promote the bands. I mean, if you think of what the mobile phone companies claim to pay for big chunks of spectrum around, you know, seven, 800 megs, um, also up at 2.1, 2.6 gigs. I mean, that's, you know, we're talking, you know, millions and millions. I, I know some prices, I see 750 million you know, pounds for sort of things like that. And you know, whether that's accurate or not, I don't know. But, you know, th there's there's big money in this, certainly for Ofcom. But, you know, I'm not surprised they're promoting it. I'm fighting for some wireless channels in, in London at the moment for some microphones. Ofcom, they're really helpful. It's con you know, For me, it's convincing the people above me that we need to pay for them. But, uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see what people want to put in there. I think, you know, like Chris says, we've all got wireless devices in our house. My bell, my boiler thermostat's wireless. I dread to think what else is running wireless that we probably don't even realise. So, um, yeah, there's, the demand is going to go up, and you know, eventually, years from now, we will run out of wireless space. So, you know, use the bands that we've got before they take them away. Yeah, yeah, but we're, we're probably on light or infrared or something by then. Frank, Frank. Well, we are, aren't we, with infrared, with your, your, your remote for your tellies. Yeah, yeah, we are, we are, aren't we? Frank, um, I know it's a UK thing, and uh, we've skirted around it, but uh, anything like this happening in the States? 
Oh, you bet. You bet. And as so I was thinking uh, of this, uh, Ofcom is doing a good thing by putting out this white paper because these kind of documents, to the extent they get propagated and people like us, you know, talk about them and other people hear about them that wouldn't ordinarily do. People start thinking in new ways. The sentence in the abstract in our story, remote crop monitoring, where you got farmers, a lot of what they do. I've heard about this. Is, you know, involves timing that is based upon certain metrics and indicators. And some of those metrics and indicators are temperature and how much moisture is in the soil. Before I retired as a professor, I was in charge of a very large project with NASA, and we tried to stimulate an industry to do some of this stuff what we, through remote sensing. What we did not have at, at, back in 1997 was this maker culture with Arduino and Raspberry Pi-oriented sensors. They were much more expensive then and tend to, to, to operate on more expensive and uh, computers that could be harmed in, in tough environments. Well, what do we have now? Uh, so during uh, the Christmas season, I, I was at a, a Christmas party, and the, the person I wound up sitting next to uh, owns a company. And in several states here in the U.S., they do one thing. They remotely monitor the irrigation systems in clients who are farmers they turn the irrigation on the farmer doesn't have to do it so when i read that here i thought you know there's a tremendous industry beyond agriculture and manufacturing where amateur radio operators and makers who come to the nexus of both computer programming sensor development and rf and there's not that many degree programs that teach all three of those things as a consolidated curriculum. So I think this paper, Bo, it's very, you know, uh, rather than saying, hey, they're not looking at ham radio, at least indirectly, they're looking directly at what ham radio can provide, can teach, and can educate. So I sort of see it from, from that sort of perspective. Yeah, I kind of agree with you, Frank, because there's a lot – um, that there's a lot which a ham radio license gives you that gives you a perspective on, on, on so much in the world and what the industry is doing and how things work. And, uh, yeah, like yourself, I was playing with, um, a wireless Wi Fi operated switch last night, uh, that has a temperature sensor on it and could turn on a central heating boiler or a fan or whatever. Now, these things cost something like uh, $15. Now, <laughs> this, it, it, the technology, the hardware is getting so cheap now uh, because it's becoming mainstream. So uh, well, I think we will see more and more um, Wi-Fi, wireless, uh, microwave stuff uh, being used in all sorts of industries. A UK story next. Um, two milestones for distance learning. The uh, Bath-based Advanced Distance Learning Team have announced that uh, their 700th student has passed the uh, Advanced Amateur Radio Exam. Now, we don't teach um, the Advanced course in the UK, Chris and I, because it would take 13, 14 weeks to do it if we were doing it um, in uh, weekends. Uh, but the Bath-based group do it uh, with distance learning and... Uh, I know Chris is a fan because you did it, didn't you, Chris? I did. I did. In fact, you recall we did an interview with Steve Hartley. Probably, when did I do mine? Four years ago? Five years ago now, I think it was. So, yeah, I did an interview with Steve at the time. I couldn't tell you which episode it was. But, yeah, I mean, fantastic uh, achievement, fantastic course. I think they've really hit the sweet spot. They've managed to find a really efficient way of teaching people, you know, without having to, you know, book rooms or, you know, um, you know, it's a very efficient way of operating, you know, online, uh, using modern technology from home. People can study in their own time. And clearly it's been very, very successful and the numbers bear that out. So, uh, and I think they were saying they've raised quite a bit of money for charity, Mars, haven't they? Yeah, they certainly have. I mean, they've, they've raised over £15,000 for charity. So that's the other uh, mega milestone, which is um, not to be sneezed at, I'd suggest. 
So, uh, I was saying it's a good one. Mr. Rothwell, sir, you didn't do your, you, you did yours a different way. You did yours the traditional way at Reading, didn't I you? I did. Yeah, I went to the Reading and District Amateur Radio Club um, because I'm one of these people when I, to, to teach me something, you've got to teach it to me and you've got to let me play with the kit. I haven't got the attention span to learn something from a book or remotely. And, you know, I, you know, if I can sit in a classroom, I can ask questions. That's how I learn. And so Reading and District did the, um, the, the, the course and the exam you know, for a few months, and that's how I got my advanced. But uh, the milestones, you know, congratulations, 700 is uh, amazing. There's a quote on here that interested me, though. Will they make it to 800 before they close down the advanced classes? Does that indicating they're thinking of closing this down? Get in there now, folks, if you, you know, want to get your, your license. I'm not saying they're going to close it down, but, you know, it's a comment that was made on the... Um, on the, yeah, on the no. I assume it. I assume it, I assume it relates to the um, change of the syllabus, which will be happening, I think, in August this year. So maybe there's something changing there. I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay. I have to check actually. So, yeah, yeah it's, great, it's a great time, and I know, you know Chris has got his license through there. So I mean, lots of other people have. So go for it. Yeah. Have a better time. And so just to answer that question about having you, 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 you do have a tutor, and you can contact your tutor if you need to, some help. So it's not just a. It's okay. not purely online. You can email them. I think you can arrange. Well, certainly when I did it, it might have changed since then. But uh, uh, you could arrange a Skype session with your tutor, that sort of thing. If you need any help, so uh, it's not just. So that's why it's not unlimited. It's not like a book where you mm. know you can scale it unlimitedly. Yeah. There, 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 there is there is a ratio of tutors to students. So um, you so do have that. A lot, that's a lot well. better way of doing it. I think. I think from my point of view, it was. I don't think this was available at the time, or I didn't know about it at the time. And um, no, I think it was like when they were Martin, talking yeah. about, you know, the modulation of things. I forget the questions that were in the exam. It was a long time ago. But when they were talking about, hey, we'll talk about modulation. We'll talk about harmonics and things like this. You know, you can show me on paper. You can explain it to me. But, you know, where we were doing it was actually based inside a, a radio communications um, company. It was like a PMR company who had loads of test kit. And they're like, hey, let's go get this, plug it in, and we'll show you what this means. And I was getting that absolutely right in front of me. So from my point of view... That's why I wanted to do that. But had the bath one been available before that, I'd have jumped at it. I'd have, I'd have certainly had a go with it. Yeah. Well, I think different people learn different ways. So, and, uh, oh, uh, definitely. Um, so, uh, Dan, you're heavily involved with training and uh, your extra class uh, study guide uh, certainly helped uh, one of the guys I know at the club uh, get his license. Um, but, do you do you supplement? Do you do an extra? I mean, I know you do a technician in a day. Do you do uh, any extra classes as well? Nah, well, you know, I've taught general classes, but I haven't yet taught an extra class. I, I'd really like to do more online stuff because you know that's the way things are going. People people don't necessarily have time to come to classes, and if they can steal ten or fifteen minutes here and there, they can get on an online course and and uh, you know do that. So that's why I really wish I I had more, I don't know what time expertise to to set up these online classes. Yeah, I know that most uh, all the the, the society is moving more toward online classes, but I'm I'm a sort of person where if I don't book the time, um, I I need to be it away from everything else with the phone switched off because I'm going to get too many. Uh, too many uh, calls on my time if i'm if i don't go off and do something um there's always something else will fill that time very very quickly so uh, yeah uh, online training lots of people are doing and i think it's a good thing frank you spent a long time in education uh what's your thoughts on this well i started using email in classes in the early 1980s and having big television sets rolled into classrooms hooked up to these newfangled pcs on floppy drives so i i have done a lot of that and i've taught online and i think to some degree there's some questions about the focus of the content you know the the lower level high level uh, and quite a number of variables that go into it. Now, with that, I agree with Dan. I think particularly for the first two classes in the States, that's much more amenable to online. The extra might might be a little more of a challenge, but it's not that it's insurmountable. And so I, I think it's good to have 
wide input into the syllabi and course curricula for these things to, to put them online. One of the big problems that social psychologists have, have shown us in the last two to three years is that that term multitasking really doesn't happen. Uh, you task uh, one at a time. And so I think you've alluded to this is that the, the only downside or one downside, I would say, is that you, you can't, there's no magic to it. You've got to focus on the material long enough to, to get it. So that's the only thing I think we need to guard against. It's, it's not a take two aspirins and call me in the morning. You'll feel better type of thing. It's not an easy fix, but I do think that Dan is correct. It's kind of the way to go because you don't learn anything if you're not enrolled in a class. And if you can't take your two feet and use those to get you to a class in body, then doing it online, uh, you know, is certainly a clear alternative. Yeah, yeah. Well, that sounds that sounds good. Yeah, easy success. So, uh, yeah, great to the Bath Group uh, for doing that, and uh, congratulations to all those who've passed. Our next news story: Electronic Notes opens Ham Radio Store. Um, that sounded a bit strange, and I went off and had a look at this. And Electronic Notes. I believe, unless I've got this totally wrong, is um, a website by Ian Paul, G3YWK. Uh, I interviewed Ian all back in uh, 19th of uh, uh, July 2009, 10 years ago uh, we spoke to Ian. And he's a very, very clever guy, author uh, of a number of books in the UK. Website's well worth, website's well worth a look. And I would suggest, Dan, you, you, you said you looked at it, but uh, the, you didn't think it was much on there for sale. No, I didn't see any links, and uh, uh, so I don't know what the state of it is. I, I, he's got a lot of pages there with, with different categories, but no uh, Amazon links yet. And, you know, this isn't hard to do, actually. I, I've got these pages on my website, too. People can buy uh, Baofengs and antennas and books off my website if they want. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it, I guess what, what, when I do it on my website, I try and like be a little bit of a curator, right? So here's our things that look good to me or that I've used. And, uh, hopefully this guy would do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the, 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 maybe you don't see them down there are, there are links on there and maybe there is perhaps certain pages I haven't got them on, but, uh, if you go into the. So the ham radio section there, there are some links. There. Well, a lot of adverts, I suppose, on Amazon for, th for things on there. And uh, I think there is a section, a, sp a specific ham radio store section. It's got links on there to various products that uh, are for sale from different um, different uh, Amazon sellers. So I don't think Ian himself is selling this stuff. I think he's basically advertising. Very I think he's pick. I think he's picked products on Amazon that I think he thinks are maybe relevant to, to people that look at his website and he's. Uh, He's put links on there, so I believe he's getting maybe some sort of uh, commission. I'm not really sure, but uh, you know, it's it's a good site. It's got lots of lots of information there. I mean, it's the first time I've seen this actually, but it's lots of it's lots of really good information. There. It's like a it's almost like, like Wikipedia, but obviously something that's written himself, which tells you all about you know lots and lots of different electronics and and other topics, communications and things topics. So uh, I think it's pretty good actually. Maybe I mean, I'm not seeing it because I'm in the states. Oh, no. maybe it could be. Oh, I, I, I see it, Dan. There are Amazon links. Here. What you have to do is click on the products, yeah. and and then you've got subcategories like HF transceivers, VHF transceivers, yeah. etc. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. Some of it now. Oh, I know. I'm, I know. I'm not seeing it because I got ads turned on. <laughs> That'll be oh the ad blocker. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I, in fact, I had that same then. problem when I set them up on my website. I, I set these things up, and I said, "Wow, oh, I'm not seeing these. What's going on? Well, it's, of course, I got an ad blocker. <laughs> Dan, you have to be in it like to it. win it, right? So I'll be honest, that's, <laughs> that's probably the same issue that I've got, because I'm looking at this website thinking, okay, new ham radio store. This is interesting. Had a look at it, thinking, am I missing something? Because, I mean, there's loads of information on this page. But if you consider the, like, the ham radio stores that we all know and love, um, I won't give them any mentions now, but we, you, you know who the main ham radio stores are. You know, you go to them, you click on transceivers, you're going to go straight to a page selling transceivers. 
you go here, I click on this, okay, HF transceivers, and I've got stuff talking about, you know, base or mobile power output, mode sensitivity, like, but there's nothing here that I'm seeing initially of where to buy stuff from. So it's not really a store. There's a link that says check out the ham radio store. I'm looking on here, okay, analog multimeter, click on that. I've got loads of information about analog multimeters, but nowhere to buy it. But as, as you know, as, as Dan's saying, I must have ads turned off, yeah. which unfortunately, um, if you're going to develop a site like this, you need to develop it around people that use ad blockers, which are becoming more and more, I think, now. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I kind of also wanted to highlight that there is some really, really good uh, tech information. Ian. Oh, yeah, the, the tech information, I'm not questioning that, absolutely brilliant. But reading it from the point of view of a ham radio store, thinking, am I missing something? Yeah, yeah. There's also... <laughs> well, the tech, you know, tech stuff, go check it out, electronics-notes.com. It's really worth reading. There's a lot of really good information on there. Yeah, and uh, Ian's done a number of very intuitive uh, videos as well, which are well worth They're... a watch, uh, which I think are linked from this page. But, uh, yeah. Well, I think uh, we've uh, realised why uh, we, we don't see it as a store because we've got ad blockers on. But uh, I still think um, for our listeners, it's uh, well worth a look. Uh, links will be in our show notes, but it's uh, electronic notes. If you do Google for electronicnotes.com, you'll um, you'll find it so, from there. Another news story, and this one's probably not going to take long to discuss, but there's a gentleman in Toledo uh, that's been in Radio 50 years. Well, a lot of people have, but uh, he's um, got, he's probably got a little bit of an ex- obsession in that uh, he's, um, his hobby has become a museum, or some people might call it a museum. To him, it's a hobby. And when I looked at the pictures, I thought, wow, Jerry O'Reilly, W-H-J-O-R. Interesting piece of kit. Frank, do you want to go first on this one? Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting story. Uh, and I think these are valuable for, uh, kind of a young people that come into the hobby. And I know that sounds like, oh yeah, yeah. They want to listen to grandpa Jones, uh, you know, all what he did back when he was a boy, but at the same time, hearing about what someone spent their life doing, I think appeals to some young people and it's, it's very exciting, uh, about it. Case in point, everyone in the world knows who Elvis Presley was. The best impersonator that people will say is a young Quebecian in Canada who learned about Elvis from his grandfather. His native tongue is French, but when he opens his mouth, it's Elvis Presley singing Blue Christmas. So, you know, there's a certain market, I think, for that kind of reflective story. And obviously, people of my age, I'm 66, you know, we love hearing about this because we can identify with with so much. So, you know, it's a very interesting thing. He's he's collected just, you know, literally thousands of different radios. And I hope that there's an opportunity to curate those things, depending upon what he wants to do with them over the rest of his life, because there's a place for that. Yeah, there certainly is. And I, I, we talked about uh, a couple of programs back about um, some of the old magazines and old books you could download. And I, I'm in the process of reading a uh, an old book, uh, an uh, old handbook. And it, might, it said it was in 1930, but I'm sure it's earlier than that because it talks about spark gap transmitters and and I, i've never had any experience i'd love to have a play i'd love to see one in the real because you know this is the sort of stuff that nobody ever does these days for, for very good reasons but uh, there you go on that so dan what's your thoughts well toledo is just down the road from me in arbor and the the toledo club is having a uh, a swap meet uh, next month so i'm gonna head down there and see if i can meet this guy I think he'd be worth um, worth a look, uh, as I say. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just looking at some of the, the pieces of kit sometimes, you look at it and go, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, that, oh that's how they did that or whatever. And, uh, you know, just because something's old doesn't necessarily mean it was bad technology. Um, you know, let's face it, the Superhat was designed in the 1920s and uh, it's been our mainstay for what? nearly a hundred years so it's uh 
you know, he's worth a look. Martin, well, he's got uh, the, also, he's got the first uh, Heath kid he ever built. Wow. Yeah, Ma so how about that? Martin, let, let me just interject this. I had the opportunity to attend a what's called um, Tech Jam in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. And and there was a, uh, a a guy, I forget his name and call, but he built a, a, a spark gap, and he calls it Blue Lightning. And he actually had to get a get per, a permit to use it and fire it up. And it was at the Georgia Institute of Technology there is where the meeting was. And I'll tell you, if you've never seen one of those, you will never forget it. You can smell the ozone in the air after that thing has, has transmitted for a bit. And it just takes you back. And so he, he does those talks periodically. And I'm sure some other people have, have built replicas. But you're, you're right. Once you see that in person, uh, it will change. Uh, it will change you. Yeah, well, the book I'm reading it was it's very interesting, and, and I'm, I'm kind of reading it through and thinking, yeah, this is sort of technology that I've never seen, and the fact that the guys are saying, yeah, oh, we're we're on two hundred meters and uh, we're doing this and that, and you're thinking, okay, okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, I, but it was uh, it it. it the old technology, sometimes it's worth understanding where you came from to where you're going. And, uh, you know, if he's got a lot of kit there, I think that's well worth a look if somebody can get there. What do you think, Martin? Well, 50 years in the radio business, you've got to congratulate the guy. I mean, he does does sound like very much like a guy that uh, um, was over here, doesn't he? Jerry Wells, who ran the, uh, was it the Vintage Wireless Museum? Similar sort of uh, setup, I think. But uh, he's obviously in it for the love of the job. Um, you know, and if you're lucky enough to get a job that you, you love that much, then uh, well, well done to you. You know, he's obviously well known to uh, the radio users around him. They say that uh, uh, police, fire, hospitals, anyone who uses radios and scanners go to him when they uh, need a tune up. So uh, he obviously knows his stuff, and uh, yeah, good luck to him. Yeah, yeah, I would say that you know, it, it's good to have these people around as we move more, more forward. Um, you know. It, it, it's strange. We teach um, setting up a VFO on the uh, intermediate course, which is the equivalent of general in the States, um, and it's one of the practicals. And it's quite strange because we teach people how to do it, and it's great, but it's such ancient technology because if you were setting up a handy talkie to put it on frequency, you don't do any of that. You connect it up to a computer with a test set, and you change a number in a in, in, in a, a program. You change a number in a register in in the memory from one number to another, and that moves its frequency. You know, but understanding how a VFO works, I think, is still important. What do you think, Chris? No, I agree. Um, I was going to say a point that Marcy made around about Jerry Wells. Was Dan in Dulwich. Um, very very similar story, where Jerry was spent many many years doing a similar thing. Uh, maybe slightly older, I think, but um, he was he, he he repaired radios and I think electronics, and uh, he had a huge huge collection of of radios. And we've been down there as a club, and we've seen all the um, the sheds that he built because he had so many so much. Uh, in the end, he had so many radios. He built uh, a number of well large sheds in his back garden, and then he took over half of next door's garden <laughs> and built some more sheds there and. And um, it sounds like uh, Jerry in, in Ohio there is uh, he's probably quite similar. So, uh, yeah, very uh, very interesting. And, and hopefully Jerry can continue what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope so. I hope he enjoys himself. He obviously looks the picture. It looks as though he enjoys himself. And uh, let's hope uh, he uh, is able to carry on for many, many years. Well, our last news story, we've gone quite long today because we've had quite a lot of news stories and I should have cut a few back, um, but uh, um, the guys and I have been quite interested in some of these. Uh, Frank, you put this one in, reshaping the ARRL objectives, uh, focusing the ARRL HQ structure. Uh, our new CEO is doing a good job, isn't he, Frank? Well, I think so. Uh, let, me, let me kind of throw this out here this way. You know, a manager of a business typically implements, manages, and orchestrates existing processes. We make widgets, we do it A, B, C. I got to make sure A, B, and C happen. 
An executive, on the other hand, not only understands those processes, but has a vision for the goals and objectives of the overall organization. And I think the ARL, as certainly Dan and I and the rest of us on this podcast have observed over the last couple of years, have have had uh, sort of some fistfights in the kitchen with many members over, uh, what are you doing? Where are you going? Uh, it, the ARL's behind, and, and so on and so forth. And so the new CEO, Howard Mickle, WB2ITX, seems to be taking the bull by the horns, uh, as, as they would say in Texas, and he's changing some things. Now, what he's doing is he's changing the management structure, and that started on February 11th uh, in Newington, and he's doing it by changing three things. One, he's created a management council so that Things are not as siloed. In other words, people can talk to one another horizontally rather than having to go up vertically and and that sort of thing. The second one is a a product development manager. And that person's job is to think about ideas, whether it's a product or service, a pilot program and so forth, test those things and figure out what to recommend to the CEO to innovate, to serve the membership better. And the motto that Howard Mickle says is, if we're going to fail, we want to fail fast. We want to find out what innovation works and and either do it or not and move on to the next big idea. The third thing, and I think many of us who are customers of the ARL by virtue of being members, is, it will enjoy this and appreciate it. It's the position of a marketing communications manager. And that is to change the way that the league communicates to its membership and potential members, and not just what is communicated, but how it's communicated. Now, the big picture, and we talked a little bit about this, is is this new 450 some odd thousand dollar lifelong learning platform. And, you know, that's a big uh, kettle of fish. I think Dan's written about some of that on his blog. But the thing that caught me in this is they're buying a new modern association management software system that may have a bigger impact on on the member and potential member experience than anything else I've seen them do. Their website, as they say, is so 1990s. And I'm hoping that those behind-the-scenes online transaction processing systems, you know, will help create things. So here very quickly, he's made three structural changes that a manager who's just trying to keep status quo wouldn't do, but an executive would. Now, I'll kind of end with that, and I just say, bravo, will it work? Time will tell, but he's certainly doing the things that an executive should do. Well, I, it sounds good, Frank, and uh, I think you you can't sit still. You have to move forward. You have to look for new ways of doing things, because uh, if we just sit still and do nothing, it'll implode. Dan, your side of the pond, and as Frank says, you've blogged about this. What's your feelings on some of this? Yeah, so uh, I talked a little bit with uh, Rhea Jairam, actually, N2RJ, who's on, now on the board about the uh, this $450,000 uh, investment. And, and it really is more than just a lifelong learning program. It, as Frank says, it's also association management software. And uh, there's some other component in there. I forget w- what it is. So, so it's it's really an investment in the corporation it, you know it's more of a corporate thing which is good the the one thing that um i took out of this article and i'm looking for it here he said he says say something about um you know our brand currently uh works here it says our brand works with our traditional members it's not working for newly licensed hams and and that's that's really a critical thing in his talk to Ham Radio University, uh, uh, Mickle said, uh, showed some numbers, you know, and it's something like, I don't know, I forget the exact numbers, but it's low. It's like 20% of newly licensed hams join the league and half of those drop out after a year. Well, I mean, that's just a terrible statistic. So they really need to uh, focus in on that and, and get more members. And, and I hope <laughs> that once again, I'll just say, throw this out again, that they set a, a, a target. They should set a target for the percentage of licensed radio amateurs in the U S who are a double members. I think, I think 
that's that's kind of a critical thing because everything will flow from that. What steps they should take will flow from that. But but I but I like all these changes. He's stirring the pot, and that's what's needed. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you that uh, we're moving. You guys are moving forward, and and it'll be interesting times. And uh, there's a there's a difference between the states and the UK. Well, one of the differences between the states and the UK is when somebody tries and fails they're not seen as a social leper. Uh, they're just seen as somebody who's tried, and if they try something else, you give them the support and go forward. Over here in the UK, if you try and fail, everybody, the minute you've failed, everybody moves away from you and doesn't want to be involved with you. So uh, I think that's a, you know, that's, that's a good thing that uh, lots of things are being tried because that's the only way to move forward. So, uh, yep. yeah. Mr. Rothwell. Your comments? I don't have very much to add on this to say it's not something that, that directly affects us here. But, uh, yeah, if he's making changes, hopefully they're for the good. Hopefully they're going to go in the right direction. And uh, good luck to him. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good one. What about you, Chris? Well, I think well, I think Frank makes a good point. In fact, Frank and Dan made some good points. Um, it sounds like um, he's a good guy. He's, he understands how an organisation can be transformed. And he's 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 you know he's making those making those steps. As someone that works in IT enterprise architecture, um, then the first place you start is with the business, and it's understanding your customer, it's understanding your processes, and I think that's some of the things that are described in that article there. Reflect that, reflect he's talking about understanding that uh, yeah okay this works for their well established hams, but actually it's not working well for the new hams. So he's understanding his customer, and he's looking to implement software for example to, to help to to transform the way they work so i think he's probably uh probably a bright guy yeah yeah certainly sounds it and it is the new hams that are coming in uh that if we re- retain them uh, they will be the old hams uh, in 30 40 years time but uh we've got to get them in and and the hobby we keep saying this the hobby's changing and that's what the beauty of our hobby is. It's changing all the time. You know, you cannot live in spark gap transmitters with Morse only uh, on one band or whatever it is. The whole hobby is moving on. We're becoming far more technical and it's a, it's a bigger interest. So we've got to keep those people interested. Anyway. One, one thing that struck me, Martin, I'll add this as a postscript, is that he's trying to add value of the league membership to customers. I want to make sure Dan responds to this. Uh, do you think he would get a positive response out of his members, Dan, if they were to announce, if you're a member of the ARL and you buy one of our publications from us, you get free shipping? Well, that's certainly one thing they could try. I I, I think that uh, that's always been a big complaint. To tell you the truth, I buy my ARRL books from Amazon because I got Prime. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and see that's that's part of it is they also sell wholesale to Amazon and Amazon does a great job, don't they, Martin? Uh yeah. in getting those books out to uh, out to people. And and that's great. And I'm a prime member as well. But if you're the league and you say, Okay, I'm selling that wholesale to Amazon for resale, I'm selling retail to my customers and charging them a two dollar handling fee and charging them shipping, and they're my members. What if you did away with that uh, shipping and handling fee? Why? Because there are members, and that's a value you get for being a member. Well, there's, Those- there's yeah, they, that's that could be one of them. They, they need to look at a whole bunch of other things too, but that certainly could be one of them. Yeah, yeah. But then, guys, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, if they say they're going to give you free shipping, they normally roll the shipping price in the price of the the item. Uh, and I'll be well, they could, but they would make more by, with all due respect to Amazon, by the la- you got, like Dan and I might just order from ARL if we got free shipping there as well. And we're both instructors, so we get a little bit of a Benny on buying stuff from them if we're li- registered instructors. My only point is, is if he's, if he's going to walk the walk of this talk he's given, uh, Martin, is that you got to actually do things. Yeah. And yeah. people see these change and I was just throwing that out. Not this by far would not be the only thing. But that's one very strategic win they could get very quickly. Yeah. Right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Right. Well that concludes the news stories and uh I say almost an hour with the news stories, so that's not bad. 
Uh, considering we covered a hell of a lot tonight. Now let's see what the guys have been up to uh, since the last time they were here. Chris, do you want to go first? I can do. Since the last time I was on, I don't think I've actually done... I might have been on HF once. I've done very little radio, to be honest. I've been pretty busy with other things, I'm afraid. So um, not much in terms of what I've been doing. What I'm planning to do, well, as you know, Martin, we're doing a... A foundation course early, well, in during March towards the end of March, actually. So we'll be uh, hopefully getting some more uh, people here in the UK get the license. Um, it's a it's a two day course plus the exams, so it's actually altogether three days. We do two days plus a, a, a morning's revision, um, and then they take the exams. So um, that's what's coming up for, for you and I, Martin. Um, just one other thing, I've noticed we, we reported um, back when we did the. When we did the National Ham Fest, that the year soon. In fact, we first talked about it when we were over in Germany last year, and then we saw it again at the National Ham Fest. The the new year so FTDX 101D, which is the SDR based um, transceiver that uh, Yesu have, have had announced um, back at uh, back in Germany, possibly possibly back back in Tokyo. But uh, they've now got a price. I've noticed that um, it's been sold now for certainly in the UK. It's it's. Um, I don't think it's available to buy just yet, but they've certainly released the price now, which is three four what sorry three one four nine sorry th- yeah so three thousand one hundred fifty pounds basically is the price for that radio. So just stop mentioning that because I know that's one that's uh, people been waiting waiting to see the price of that. So they're suggesting it's going to be available, available from April here in the UK. Now I did have a quick look earlier on the website, uh, one of the American deals websites, and it wasn't it was they weren't showing the price there yet, and I think it might so we'll be awaiting FCC approval, which might be the reason why it's. Uh, they're not uh, not not showing that price just yet, but uh, just thought I mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it looks an interesting radio, and uh, it's an interesting pricing because they've kind of priced it below the competition. So uh, we'll wait and see what happens. I think there might be a little bit of price drops coming up, but uh, that's the way of the world. Mister Rothwell, are you still trying to get me into trouble or not? Uh, always i don't know ever changes um what have i been doing i've been trying to get some wireless frequencies for some radio mics at work um so we've got sort of the standard uh, license that covers the uh, the generic ones but i've been trying to get some private frequencies uh in london so uh, getting my head around that um so ofcom very very helpful but uh, unfortunately with uh they're, they're geared to taking payment via credit card and my company wants to pay pay via uh, the procurement department so um yeah that's a project that's ongoing with that but a d-star bit of fusion bit of network radio have a bit of play with that fox has uh, once again bitten through my hf coax uh, which was quite annoying so uh, i've had to fix that again probably at the fourth or fifth time I've put it through a garden hose this time, so uh, hopefully it's going to. It's still a little bit that uh, isn't in the hose, but I have and I have a feeling it's going to find that. But uh, hopefully that's going to make it a little bit harder to get hold of. And uh, I also built a couple of uh, musical Tesla coils, uh, only little ones, um, not wow. particularly big, uh, run on uh, about twenty-four volts, but they sing to each other and uh, they sing using Amiga music. And I know that will impress uh, Bill because I know that Bill's a, an Amiga fan. And the reason I use Amiga music is because they, um, the way that the old Amigas work is because they were generating the tunes on a chip, the the audio le- on left and right is completely different. So you've got the, the, the bass line on one and you've got the singing part on the other. So I've got two Tesla calls that actually sing to each other in the music. So that's just something I've been playing with. Uh, they're in little eBay kits. They were a couple of pounds each, but uh, it's it, it kept me amused. And uh, the other thing I'll say is uh, credit where credit's due. I was say congrats to the RSGB. Uh, the Radcom wrapping is now 100% compost- compostable, made out of potato starch, so you can put it out with your food waste. So uh, Radcom, I guess, is now 100% uh, recyclable when you're uh, when you're done with it. So uh, congrats to them. So well done. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. And uh, yeah, it was always, always interesting. Dan, what have you been up to? Well, so it's uh, ham radio related, but not actually on the air. Although I've been still doing lots of on the air stuff. In our club, over the past year, we had a couple of, uh, I would say, prominent members pass away, unfortunately. And I got this idea that uh, we could possibly uh, set up a scholarship at the local community college in their names. So I'm calling this the Silent Key Scholarship. And um, one of the families has agreed to uh, donate 
the equipment he had. And there's a lot of older stuff, but the equipment nonetheless, uh, to the club to um, to go to, you know, the, so the sales would go toward the scholarship. Uh, one of the other guys, the family has agreed to make a donation. Uh, we haven't talked about the numbers yet. But anyway, that's what I'm working on, trying to, trying to uh, figure out how to actually do this, uh, what the best way to do this, and then actually sell the equipment to raise the funds. So that's kind of a – it's totally different, but it's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that sounds, uh, that sounds a, a novel way of doing it. And, uh, yeah, it, it keeps um, – the uh, silent key in the club's uh, people's mind, doesn't it? So that's a good one. I like that. Frank, yeah, we haven't oh, we haven't sorry. yet decided like the criteria for giving out the scholarship yet. But my thought is to uh, either give it to someone who already has a ham radio license or is working uh, for a degree in a technical field, and uh, so that's that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it must be that they'll be probably more difficult to decide who gets it rather than doing it. But uh, um depends how many people apply as well. But uh, Right. Uh, so that sounds good. Frank, what have you been up to? Well, I, I've been doing a little building, a little giving talks, and um, then some service work. The building, uh, a couple of battery boxes, had uh, got a small one done and uh, was giving it to the ham I built it. For and the at, last night at the club meeting and the speaker canceled it at the last minute. So I gave a little impromptu lightning talk on a 36 amp hour uh, battery bank in a small resin. We call them ammo cans here in the states. Got meters and stuff. You can hook a solar panel into it and it'll recharge with a solar control charge and all that good stuff. Building some of those. Uh, there's nothing like getting free stuff like free recycled batteries to motivate you to spend more money. So free will generate more money. Uh, given a couple of talks, uh, one on RF propagation, focusing on the chemistry of ionization and, and how that works. I'd never seen that really explained in all the talks on propagation uh, around. So I kind of focused on a little bit of that. And a lot of it's got to do with changing atmospheric. Uh, chemical composition way up there in the ionosphere. And then I've, um, as of a couple of weeks ago, I have rejoined the ARL field staff as assistant director for the Delta division. I had dropped out of that role a couple of years ago uh, over some of the shenanigans with the Parity Act. But uh, I think with some of the changes we're seeing in, in Newington and stuff, kind of come back and, and I'll serve in, in that role. So. Yeah, sounds like you've been real busy, Frank. And you be careful, because if Chris hears you're doing talks, he might try and book you for one of our club talks. He's he booked Dan at some time ago. And we can we, we can discuss that after after the recording, Martin. Actually, yes. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry, Frank. You've been fitting up here. Uh, no, no, I I actually do do some of that. And if you can't get a good speaker, I'm available. And that's it's got, <laughs> what do you mean a good speaker? You are a good speaker. Think about where you've just said that, Frank, and how many listeners we have. Music to my ears, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry, Frank. I think we fitted you up there. Um, yeah, what... for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, what have I been up to? Well, probably not very much. Um, like yourself, I did a club talk. Um, don't know if I mentioned it last podcast. The, the weeks seem to sort of just conjole into one big day and things just wrap up all through uh did do a talk uh, for the club and i've been asked to do that for another club in london so uh, that might happen soon uh i've also uh chris and i didn't make it to the belfast last month which is quite a strange one yeah that's quite a strange one because uh, we normally try and get up there once a month i've been doing some one-to-one -one work with uh, a new guy that's tipped up at the club and um it was quite interesting because I had me first hands on uh, with an FT eight one eight. Yeah, it, it's effectively the upgraded eight one seven, but it just felt a bit different. I can't explain, but it yeah, it was good. And because uh, the guy hasn't got a license, has bought it. He was absolutely over the moon when I had a uh, two meter contact about uh, on the on the uh, rubber duck area about thirty miles away. But we are on top of a big hill, so uh, that was quite good. Yeah, like Martin Ruffwell, I've done a fair amount of uh, network radio stuff. Um, 
not a lot, had a lot of time to do much else. There's been a lot, lot going on over here. But uh, all in all, we try and do as much radio as we can. And uh, as I say, I'm normally operating from the car whenever I can as well. So all in all, I think we've all been fairly busy. So I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Oh, cheers, guys, and uh, great fun as usual. Yeah, I, I'd like to thank Mr. Martin Rothwell, M0SGL. Very welcome, great fun. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Mr. Dan Rovacek, KB6NU. Glad I could make it. Yeah, I'm glad you could make it as well, Dan. I was a bit worried at one point in time. And yeah. uh, Mr. Frank Howell, K4FMH. As James Taylor wrote and sang, good to see your smiling faces and enjoyed it greatly. Yeah, great guys. And you know what? For the first time ever, I got all your call signs right without screwing it up. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Martin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, now I'm going to say 73s to you all. And as Chris pointed out a few episodes back, this is not the end of the podcast when we say 73s. This is the end yeah. of this section. Yeah, stick so, around. So, there's more coming up. Yeah. Yeah, so 73 all, and we'll catch you again soon. 73. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And now it's time to have a look at the news in brief with me, Colin M6BRY. We start with news here that the US Navy and their Department of Naval Air Warfare uh, Center Weapons Division, that's a bit of a mouthful, has adopted amateur radio training as a possible new approach to the basic RF electronics instructions. Now, basically, they had 20 of their employees they took part in a week-long course in uh, California in December. And uh, based upon this, um, not only did the, uh, they successfully obviously have technician-licensed uh, officers, um, but a, uh, another group, also got involved, and uh, they've, uh, I say, filled up another uh, 10 uh, slots as well and got those uh, amateurs, uh, or those uh, seamen, um, I say, licensed as uh, amateurs as well. Um, and it looks like as well they could also be moving on uh, through the uh, the grades as well as their interest uh, peaks. So certainly very interesting news here of how the military is using amateur radio skills uh, to teach uh, uh, modern recruits uh, more information uh, about uh, RF and uh, electronic instructions. So uh, certainly interesting news. Uh, link to the full story on icqpodcast.com and certainly one worth our uh, checking out. A position has become available at the RSGB. Stephen Purser, a Golf Whiskey 4 Sierra Hotel Foxtrot, who's currently the RSGB's company secretary, has let the board know that uh, after uh, two years in the role, he'll be stepping down in the spring. Stephen has been instrumental in upgrading the legal documents related to society and regularly advising the board where governance changes are necessary. So they're going to be looking for a uh, new secretary. It's a voluntary position, and we'll put a link on the ICQ podcast website or where you uh, might want to get involved and help out. News as well in the back to the states. The news there that uh, the amateur radio population is uh, slightly growing in 2018, and uh, by about one percent. Uh, so on a year on a year on year stat from 2007. So in total in the States, there's 755,430 uh, licensed representatives, um, which uh, it means it's just over 7,000 increase uh, year on year. Um, so certainly, as I say, probably the biggest amateur radio market in the world and uh, it's continuing to show, as I say, some growth there. Uh, I say 1% out of there. So lots and lots of stats and figures there. And again, we'll pop those on icqpodcast.com for you to, to read it if, if you wish. Um, but I say certainly the fact is, uh, look at this, uh, three, nearly 385,000 technicians, 175,000 generals, and 147 extras. So uh, there you go. Okay, guys. Well, we're going to head over to our features episode, which is a uh, chat with the Works All Britain team regarding their 50th anniversary. I hope you enjoy. And now, what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Well, hi guys. Tonight, I have two guests with me from the Work Tool Britain group. I have Judith, who's the uh, president at the moment, and uh, we were saying, Judith, I think you've been fitted up a little bit, hi hi. 
But uh, nice to have you with us. Nice to be here. Yeah, and we also have um, Dave, uh, David, her husband, who is uh, also the uh, treasurer for the Work Tool Britain. So you're kind of uh, very, very involved with this. And uh, Work Tool Britain is a really, really interesting uh, subject. And a lot of people have tried to copy it, I think. But uh, you're still the first and the best, I suggest. So um, tell us a little bit about Work Tool Britain, the history of where you come from. Well, can I just say primarily I'm uh, the awards manager for Works All Britain. I do the treasurer's job as well, but uh, it's the awards manager's ship that actually takes most of my time. Right, so you've got a double role, the same as Judith is also, I see, publicity officer, so it looks like you all do a lot of work uh, to promote the the hobby. Well, we like to think so, yes. Yeah, so tell us about um, Works All Britain, how it started and... uh, how you move forward to today? Well, um, historically, I wasn't there at the start, obviously, but uh, 50 years ago, it all um, kicked off um, with John Morris, G3ABG, and the Connick Chase Amateur Radio Society. Uh, we can't tie it down specifically to a first date, but we do believe it was sometime in June 69. Uh, John was a geography teacher at the um, local school, and he obviously had an interest in the uh, the geography of the UK. Um, he was a um, big uh, chaser of the US counties award and he thought we should try something similar over here. Uh, right. To cut a long story short, he settled on um, using the 10 kilometre grid squares of um, the UK as the basis of um, the award scheme. Right, so that's the Ordnance Survey grid squares, isn't it? Yes, that's it. Yeah, so uh, I would say for those who I'm mildly interested. I'm in uh, TQ26, I think it is. But uh, I can't remember much more than that. <laughs> but uh, So going forward, 50 years is, is quite a phenomenal uh, achievement to set something up for 50 years and have it running, isn't it, uh, David? Yeah, there's been uh, one or two changes um, along the way to the scheme. It was fairly basic. When I first started in '78. As a shortwave listener, despite uh, my call sign as a G4, I, I began the scheme uh, nine years after it started and first got involved in 79. Uh, got co opted onto the committee in 79. I've been stuck on there for the last 40 years. So I've seen uh, one, two changes on the, on the way. Um, it's a fairly simple scheme, uh, just three or four main awards when we started, but um, uh, it's developed and grown. So there's quite a lot within the scheme itself. Um, variation of awards, and there's a lot there to choose uh, for people to choose their own individual tastes and likings. Right, right. So, so um, from what I remember, and I'll put this question to Judith: When when you become a member of uh, Work Tool Britain, you effectively get what uh, is called a book, and. Uh, most of us opt to now take it on a CD or DVD or whatever it is. So I'm, mine's a, um, on a electronic media anyway. And uh, that uh, gives you a number and uh, aims you towards uh, chasing various grid squares, doesn't it, Judith? That's right, yes. The book has changed quite a bit over the years. It's changed colour and size and shape, um, particularly size of recent times because... Uh, We have now changed to just collecting squares rather than what we used to call the areas where they were subdivided, which Dave will probably go into in more detail. But that's right. Everybody has a number and they become a member of Worked All Britain. And once you're a member of Worked All Britain, you're a member for life. And we can soon find out your number if you'd like us to, Martin. Right. (laughs) Well, I'd be be interested. I came across my Worked All Britain CD the other week, um, but I'm in uh, I'm in decorating mode at the moment, so uh, it got it got put into a box somewhere. But I will find it. Uh, and uh, as I say, it would be interesting because uh, when we're doing uh, ICQ podcast, num- we get asked a number of questions, and having a work tool Britain would uh, number would be quite useful. I suggest. I'm sure it would. I'm sure that people would be very pleased to to have your number. There is a special award for collecting uh, members which again Dave will probably explain in more detail, but uh, lots of different ways that you can uh, 
activate the Laptop Britain, and we encourage people to do so, Martin. Yeah, right. So as 50 years, uh, we're obviously well into to having uh, lots of members and people joining. Um, you're well established. Uh, you've done a number of awards throughout the years, but uh, the 50-year one, tell us a bit about the 50-year award. Well, we've actually got um, three 50, uh, 50th anniversary awards running. Uh, one of them's uh, a little bit more complex for, shall we call it, the ardent uh, WA beer. Uh, it's based on the point system. You get points for various aspects of um, the WAB scheme, squares, book holders, islands, trig points, working the squares ending in 50. Like, uh, well, we're in SK51, but uh, one of our committee members down the road is in SK50, so um, he's worth... Um, next to point or two this year. So that uh, builds up on, on a point scheme up to 50 points and a trophy. But for those that might be on the fringes of WAB, we've got a, a couple of uh, simpler awards winning. Uh, one's uh, <clears throat> for working multiples of just 50 squares, so 50, 100, 150, very simple. And for working what we've um, termed this year the golden squares, that's the ones ending in the number 50 itself, like SK50, the example I gave, or um, SJ50, SP50, November, November, November 50, and so on. So uh, that's another fairly simple one that um, people can get involved with without getting too deep within WAB. Uh, we hope it'll give them a bit of a taste to uh, perhaps go a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I remember that from uh, the past that... Often you'll be working somebody and they'll come back to you and say, what, WAB square? And so if you're out and about portable, or even at home, it's worth knowing that. Even if you're not taking part in, in, in WAB, because um, it certainly helps people, and it's another thing they trace, isn't it? Absolutely. We get quite a lot of uh, uh, rarer squares off the uh, SOTA activators when uh, they're up and about uh, the mountains. Uh, plus the trig points that they're at, so um, we activate those at the same time. So um, to use a coin expression that one of the um, so to, uh, people use on their reflector is there's a lot of synergy uh, between uh, WAB and SOTA. We don't tread on their toes, they don't tread on ours, but there's this nice little overlap where if they're up a mountain at a trig point, then, then there is something for the WAB collector to uh, get as well. So... Um, I wouldn't say we, we rely on them as such, but uh, they're a very handy uh, boost for the, uh, the rarer, squares for, rarer squares for us. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense because if uh, if somebody's out doing, uh, you've gone to the effort of climbing a mountain and you're on top of a mountain top and all that sort of thing, it makes a lot of sense to say work uh, both SOTA and WAB. And, uh, you know, if you're an activator... Why not do it? It's very, very little extra work for um, a lot of fun. And you've already put the hard work in getting there, haven't you? Absolutely. And most of the uh, the guys when they go out, well, know their WAB squared. So the sort of uh, people will, because they look, they look, look at the map where they're going and uh, they're up au fait with the um, Ordnance Survey reference system. And 99.9% uh, .9 of them will know the WAB square anyway. So it's, I say, nice, nice little one there for us to, to get off them. And also, they like to uh, drop into our nets as well to um, give them the points out. And it also gives them a lot of uh, contacts from uh, wherever they are if they're struggling to get their mandatory floor. Yeah, that's, that's good. Well, I remember talking to David, um, G2POF, when he was a member of our club, and he was telling me that people go to all sorts of weird places to activate. And he was talking about, uh, oh, you can activate uh, this sandbank, you know, once every 10 years or whatever it was, which quite amazed me that people go to those sort of lengths, don't they? Yeah, yes. uh, but the, the, uh, the one that always springs to mind is uh, Square Oscar Victor zero, 0 I don't know if you know much about it, but... Uh, it's uh, just a corner of um, a hundred kilometer large square, the square Oscar Victor, that's only there at low tide. So people go to a lot of effort to activate that, but the, um, the, the real killer with that is it's at the bottom of an eight 
at um, 80 foot, 800 foot cliff. So they've got to do a bit of mountaineering to get down to this square yeah, in the first instance. People have tried the walking route. Um, those that have tried it would not recommend it. Uh, it's not um, a sandy beach to walk across to even a pebbling one. It's uh, big boulders. Some people are contemplating coming in via the sea on a kayak at it. How successful that will be, I don't know. But I'd imagine you'd want to do a placid day for that and not want to get dashed to bits on the rocks when you just, uh, land on it. But uh, uh, that's um, we have turned it uh, the Ravi's Holy Grail uh, in the past, but uh, there are some uh, squares um, yet to be activated since we went on to the new scheme in 2009. Um, so we do have a list, and if anybody's wanting a challenge, we can point them in the right direction. Yeah, there yeah, that sounds great. And I suppose the advantage from yourself is with Work Tour Britain, they're not necessarily difficult places to get to. So if um, you are, say, a disabled operator, or you're terrified of heights, you haven't got to climb a mountain uh, like in Sota or, or whatever to be able to take part in this, have you? No, not at all. The biggest majority of the WAV squares is the roads running through. And likewise with the, um, the Trig Point Award we've got. I always make this point when I'm giving a talk at uh, rallies, um, not rallies, at clubs and uh, what have you. People immediately think the Trig Point is going to be up on the hill. Uh, but if you come to the uh, lower lying counties, um, you'll find Trig Points at the side of the road. Uh, so you can drive up to them, there's some that's just a very short walk over a field to get to to activate. Some are indeed up mountains or up uh, smaller hills, so there's, uh, there's stuff there for all people of uh, all abilities, really. Yeah, yeah, sounds good, sounds good. Judith, uh, I remember the um, guys telling me that uh, people used to drive around activating multiple squares, go mobile and do it. Does that still happen these days? Oh, it certainly does. We had a, a mobile out yesterday. We probably had one today, but we've, uh, we've, Dave and I have had one of our special couple uh, trips out today. But yes, we, we still have uh, regular mobiles out and uh, quite large amounts as well. We're working in Martin. That's that's good. So so I mean, it is not just you can go mobile. You can operate from home. You can. There's a lot lot I think uh, people can do on this, and uh, I'm probably sounding so I know a little bit about it. But it's only through talking to other um, WAB members uh, that gave me a bit of an insight into this. So uh, I think it's really really interesting, uh, and. It's it's one that shouldn't be overlooked just because SOTA is uh, around, which is something that's on the air, and uh, uh, I believe one of the dealerships is trying to promote postcodes on the air. Uh, it, it, you know, don't overlook something that's been going a long time because it's well established, I'd suggest. Yes, it's uh, very popular, and um, well, can I just mention the uh, donations that we also give to charitable causes? We've, uh, I've just did a, a quick tot up uh, the uh, well yesterday, and uh, um, in the last ten years, WAB has donated uh, twenty eight thousand uh, pounds to uh, registered charities uh, from the funds we've got. Well, that that's impressive. That's impressive, David, because that's something that most amateurs wouldn't think about. You know, um, we're all interested in radio and get out there and do it, but uh, it's some of the some of the extra bits that you guys do, like the charitable work, and I should have brought that up earlier, that uh, sometimes gets forgotten by some of the amateurs, that uh, we do it as a reason. It's a hobby, it's fun, but uh, also if we can make donations, in, in that it, it's, it's a good thing. And uh, quite honestly, uh, I'm sure the people you've uh, made donations to have been very, very appreciative. Yeah, in, in the main, uh, um, we, as I say, we donate to um, UK charities, so that's out of um, uh, the amateur radio uh, realm, a lot of uh, some of the money. But uh, we, thought we make um, sure that every year we donate to the RAIBC. And uh, the other one that um, amateur radio related cause we've supported in the past is uh, St Dunstan's Amateur Radio uh, Society. So uh, they've benefited, uh, um, all of them, both of those, uh, quite a few times. 
we have a bit of a relationship with the RNLI as well. Uh, going back to, I think it was the 25th anniversary, yeah. we had a big fundraising event to, to buy and insure lifeboat. Uh, um, one, one of the smaller inflatable ones, and that was named after the UAV's founder, the um, C. John Morris. So um, I think that's actually been retired from service, but uh, only fairly recently. So that's been uh, doing um, RNLI service uh, probably 20 years or so now. Yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. So you've got the awards for this year. There's always awards going on, I know, but there's special ones for this year. Where are the listeners likely to find you at uh, rallies this year? I assume you're going to be at Newark, but where else? Well, next big one uh, we've got coming up will be at Blackpool. Uh, we'll be uh, then it's one of our regular ones. We've got the AGM at uh, Alfreds, that's a Junction 28 QRP rally. Uh, we, at the moment, we're going uh, to just about everyone in Northern Ireland, but that situation is uh, uh, going to change because our representatives are moving back to G land. Uh -huh. uh, New, New York is the other big one, as you say. Uh, we're having to throttle back a little bit this year because. Uh, We've done uh, quite a few rallies in the past, but we're going to become grandparents, hopefully, in uh, June. So that's, um, we, we're going to have to take it one step at a time, and we can't obviously uh, rebook too much, but uh, we might get uh, to the Telford rally. Um, and it's off the top of my head. We do, we've now got a representative up in Scotland, so we should be attending the best part of the Scottish rallies as well. Um, plus, um, our chappy, our book manager, Steve G6TL, uh, does a few of the small rallies down at the south of England. Yeah. Well, let me let me be the uh, first to congratulate you from the ICQ team on becoming grandparents. And I hope you have mu as much enjoyment with your grandchildren as uh, I do with mine. And uh, they're great fun, uh, especially when they get to about two, because... Yeah. They become real fun, and you can you get a lot of enjoyment from them. So let me congratulate you on that. And uh, as I say, the family is more important. If you can't make some of the rallies, uh, you have to take time out to be with the family, and that's good. And uh, as I say, I think that's uh, congratulations all round from us. So moving moving on, as um, I'm gonna gonna start to close this up now. If somebody wanted to find you, you, your website doesn't have the most easiest address to, to find, but would you like to uh, give them your website address? Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, uh, the easiest way is probably uh, just Google Works All Britain, and that will throw it up. But um, to give it its long um, uh, URL, it's worked-all-britain.org.uk. So right. you Google all uh, them. Put you in the right direction anyway. Okay, well, Google didn't take me to that one, but never mind. I, <laughs> uh, that sounds good, and thanks for giving us that that, um, that that address there, David. Judith, any last words from yourself? Gosh, Martin, I, I don't really know. We haven't really touched on Follow the Torch or the Guide Dogs. Well, There's the various things that the Work Tour Britain has done in the past. We, we can, we can cover that. It's not a problem. We can do well. We were talking about different things that WAB has done in the past. Um, we tapped in with the you know the Olympic torch when that was going around the country, yeah. And we had all the different clubs taking part in that, it was very, very successful. Um, huge crowds of people calling in, which was very nice. But we were very pleased because it involved everybody, it wasn't a case of the committee just sitting there and saying we will take charge of this. We try to involve as many people as possible in it. So we were very pleased with that. And the proceeds, the, the profit from that went to um, Veteran. Yeah. Right. Veterans yeah, UK, yes. I think is the correct title of the uh, in those days, it was yes. the name. Yeah. Um, and as David just said, we've, we always try to support RAIBC because that was um, John Morris's original plan was to try to help amateurs that were less fortunate than himself. That was one of the reasons to set the group up in the first place. So no matter what else we give, and we do try to to have a heart and to help as many as possible, we always try to involve the RAIBC. Right. Uh, 
I think that's probably as much as I wanted to say to you, really, Martin, up from that. Yeah, sorry I missed that one out, Judith. Um, no say, the, the thing is that the WAB do, does a lot of work in a lot of areas and has been involved in lots of things in the last 50 years. And uh, I'm not always uh, familiar with everything you've done, but I think you guys do a fantastic job. And uh, what I will say to people is, if you're at a rally and you see the WAB stand, go and have a chat with the guys. Find out more about it. It's something you may be very interested to find out. And when I've chatted to the guys, they've always been very, very enthusiastic about WAB. So uh, I'm, for, for this year, if you're in the UK and you go to a rally, and then go and talk, and you find a WAB there, go and talk to them, please. Uh, they won't bite you, will they? Oh, <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> of course not. No. You're quite right, Martin, that uh, it, it does, they're a very enthusiastic group. People are very enthusiastic about uh, Work Tour Britain. They really enjoy it, and, and it, that's nice for us as well, obviously, in our position to know that people are enjoying what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's good. Well, I'd like to thank both of you for turning up tonight to give me this interview. And uh, I'm going to wish you every success uh, with WAB going forward. Uh, I'm bound to meet up with you at some point in time this year. And mm -hmm. I'll pop by and have a chat and maybe we'll have a cup of tea somewhere and uh, and go from there. That would be lovely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your, all your best wishes. It's very much appreciated. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'll say 73s, and uh, yes. we'll, catch <laughs> we'll catch you soon. Thank you, Martin. Right. Hi, Mrs. B here. Please sign up to our newsletter. We won't share your data and only send you relevant podcast information. We thank you for your support. 73s, Mrs. B. Well, everybody, I really hope you enjoyed the, uh, the feature there and the celebrations this year of the 50th anniversary of the Work Tool Britain Award. Uh, certainly if you haven't uh, got your Work Tool Britain certification this year, certainly sounds like it could be the year to uh, to get on board and get that uh, cert this year. Well, with that, we've got uh, some feedback coming. Malcolm Heath, uh, Kilo India 7 Zulu Sierra X-Ray uh, contacted us and said, uh, Hi all, enjoying the show as always. Wanted to mention a couple of things happening you might find interesting. Regarding uh, EM uh, safety, it's an issue that comes up fairly frequently in my neighbourhood on the west coast of the USA. There's been some public outcry about new cell towers and also there is a guy in my area who puts up signs that talk about how cellular towers, uh, cellular phones, sorry, and Wi-Fi are giving babies cancer. They're quite graphic, these flyers, so I won't link to them, but uh, the knowledge of the dangers and safe uses of virus is definitely lacking in the general public of interest in his area. I'd actually say that's probably across the board there. Uh, wouldn't you agree, Dad? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ignorance on um, RF safety. And I, I think it, IBM had something, uh, an acronym they came out with back in the 80s, FUD. It stood for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And you can set people off on this very easy. Yeah. You know, I was listening to something the other day, and I must do some research into this about 5G and this uh, new base of um, uh, sort of mobile data connectivity coming out. And they were talking a lot about how it could be a, quite a huge risk um, for humans. I don't have the details hand. I really apologize, guys. I was listening to it in the car and I meant to go back and have a look at it. But I know one of the things they were talking about is is that um, basically it could certainly affect uh, the soft tissue on uh, on humans, uh, particularly the space under the eyes and how the radiation could get into the body and cause uh, damage that way. It's only quite scary. So I must, uh, must go back and have a little look at that. But uh, interestingly, all everyone's talking about is all the good positive news of 5G and how broadband is going to be even faster on your phone. And there could be some real health effects coming. So um, we'll have to have a look at that one sometime. Anyway, um, Malcolm carries on and says, um, secondly, uh, obviously uh, he's heard now we're all going off to Hamvention, uh, great news for you, uh, but unfortunately uh, it looks like we're going to be ships in the passing night. He's uh, uh, planning to be in the UK in London around about the same time. He was hoping to uh, pop onto the Belfast and uh, surprise us, uh, but it looks like they miss each other. But if I remember right, there are other groups on the Belfast as well, isn't there, Dad, other than, uh, than the guys you uh, work at Belfast with. So there might be some radioactivity that day anyway. Is there any way he can uh, check the activity around that time? Yes, yeah, certainly yes, Malcolm. Um, 
normally during the week, Monday to Friday, there is more often people on board in the radio room, and uh, they're, they're quite up for it. Um, there are um, uh, people there at the weekend, but not very often. Uh, we try and get up there once a month on a Saturday. I believe some people try and get up there on a Sunday, but it's a bit spasmodic during the week uh, weekends. But um, big shame. We'd love to have met you. And uh, as I say, welcome. Our apologies on that. But uh, we're going to be like passing ships in the night. Excuse the pun. And going back to your first point, this um, RF exposure. Yeah, you can... It, if you've got enough power and you're close enough to it, it will do you da damage. But uh, I think the ignorance is, is that people don't realise. They only hear the, oh, it'll give me cancer. They don't realise that you've got to be sort of almost sniffing down the horn of the microwave waveguide or whatever. Uh, all right, I'm exaggerating a bit. But the one that always gets me is that, um, yeah, even down at HF and six metres, it can be dangerous if you get too close to it. And that's why these devices are on towers, because they're up above and there is a certain amount of physical separation between the person and the radio waves, the strength of the radio waves. And if you, the most likely pe person to get uh, problems off of uh, working in close, close proximity are the poor people working on the towers, I suggest, Colin. Mm. True, 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 true. Okay, so time to wrap up the show, guys. So as always, we'd like to point you in a couple of directions. Uh, check out uh, icqpodcast.com for the latest news uh, in the uh, fortnight between the shows. Sign up for the newsletter, and uh, we'll pop you a mail uh, twice a week for the latest news stories and remind you to say to have a look there. Uh, the Facebook group, uh, so you can sign up there as well if you're a Facebook person. Uh, if you're a YouTube person, uh, if you subscribe to us at youtube.com forward slash ICQ podcast, um, one of the tips I heard this week is if you're a premium YouTube subscriber, you can listen to shows like podcasts with your screen off in your pocket and you don't have to keep the screen on. So just something I've heard this week. Not something I've tried, but I've heard that's the case from there. We'd like to uh, thank this episode's donor, Robert uh, Giselle, uh, Kilo Echo 5, Victor Yankee India. Thank you very much, Robert, for your uh, kind donation. And um, we'd also like to thank uh, Judith and Dave. Uh, Judith, uh, Golf 4 India Alpha Quebec, and Dave, Golf 4 India Alpha Romeo, uh, for taking part in the uh, the feature with us on the Work Tour Britain's Award. And of course, to the News Roundtable guys, uh, Chris, uh, Mike Zero, uh, Tango, Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra Golf Lima, Dan, Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, and Frank, Kilo 4, Foxtrot, Mike Hotel. So thanks, guys, for uh, getting involved. Right, and I'm just running through my checklist here. Check, check, check. All that done, apart from probably the most important thing, making a cup of tea for Mrs. B. Yeah, we certainly do that. But just before we do, I'm just looking at Judith's call sign and uh, G4IAQ. Two more letters, Judith, and you'd have had the call sign I'd have wanted to fight you for. <laughs> <laughs> now, Judith's a lovely lady, but uh, it was almost, almost G4 ICQ there, Colin. Well, you've got you've got W9 ICQ. What more do you want? Oh, I, I have got W9 ICQ, yeah, which I'm going to use when I get out in the States later in the year. So, yeah, now I'm going to make Mrs. B her cup of tea uh, for when she comes in. Find her a chocky Vicky. She shouldn't be long now. And... Uh, yeah, we'll have a good one, Colin. So uh, I'll say 73 to you and 73 to all our listeners. Yeah, 73 to all, guys. Uh, catch you all in a fortnight's time. Bye-bye.